John chapter 10. I'm ringing just a higher voice on this one. John chapter 10. Now listen. I'm going to read a verse in John chapter 10. I'm going to read a verse in John chapter 8. And real briefly, bring you a message tonight on the five fatal factors of youth. Or you might title the message, The Devil's Five Major Shots at Our Young People. Or you might title the message, Satan's Number One Target, America's Youth. He's after these kids. He's after them. I hate him. We ought to hate the devil. Hate him. We're being taught that hate is a bad word. Hate is a good word if you hate the things you're supposed to hate. Tonight, the devil's trying to ruin every one of these young people's lives. We've met here tonight and we've had a good time. Uh, we've enjoyed ourselves and, and we've, that was our purpose. But you know the reason we're here tonight. You know why we're here. You boys and girls know why we're here. Outside these walls tonight, there's a roaring, raging lion. And sometimes inside these walls. And he's trying to kill you. I'm going to prove to you tonight from the Bible that the devil is a murderer. We don't think that a lot of times. We think, well, the devil does this and that and he wants to use that person. According to the Bible, the devil wants to kill us. I believe there are certain people that he has using for his purposes, but he don't have no trouble getting somebody to take their place if they get bumped off. And the devil's job is to kill you before you get saved. And if you do get saved, to kill you then, keep you from doing anything for God. Let me look at, let you look at these scriptures tonight. John 10, verse 10. A reference to the devil by, made by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said here in verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said when the devil comes, he comes for three reasons. To steal something from you. What does the devil want to steal from you? We talked to you about that last youth rally. Your crown of purity. And he's stealing it from young people by the thousands in America. If he can't steal something from you, he's trying to kill you and destroy you. He's a destroyer. Look back at chapter number 8. And in chapter number 8, look at verse 44. Chapter 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. See that? He was a murderer from the beginning. The devil was a murderer from the beginning. He's trying to kill you. If you're a teenager here tonight and you're not a Christian, the devil would like to kill you tonight and drop you in hell. Brother Kim is going to represent the devil... And he's going to take this young lady here, Sister Laurie, and point this bow and arrow at her head. Now, if a man... Brother, you need to work on this just a little bit, please. If a man was right behind you tonight, boys and girls, and had that arrow pointed at your head... And all he'd have to do is let go, and that thing would stick right through your head and through your brain. You'd want to know about it, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say, oh, he's a good friend of mine. I love him. You'd say, no, get it away. Get away from me. Now, I'll tell you something, young people. The devil don't come letting you know what he's really up to. 
He comes to you in a smooth form. He comes to you in, in the form of a shiny car or a cold beer or a, or a, a good time or a party. He's got the eye laid to your heart ready to drop you in hell. This thing, this purpose of this message tonight is to maybe save some young person from going down the road to destruction before it's too late. I'm preaching to you tonight on these five fatal factors of youth. They tell us now that the danger age is between 15 and 24 and that the life expectancy for that group is getting lower and lower and lower. Why are so many teenagers dying? Why are so many young people uh, going to an early grief right in the prime of life and sometimes even taking their own life by way of suicide? I'm going to tell you tonight five arrows that the devil is pointing at young people's heart tonight by the thousands in America and you listen real carefully. The arrow number one the first fatal factor of youth is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. We're living in the generation that says this. And I know y'all of you can understand me. It's the generation of going all the way. Young people today at earlier and earlier and earlier age are being pressured into, as they say, quote, going all the way. So many surveys have been made that I could not give you the statistics of them, but the statistics in big cities show that our young people are sacrificing their pure bodies on the altar of lustful, sinful hands of boys and, and, and girls at a rock-bottom price. A teenager named Mary, who's 15 years old, was quoted as saying, I wasn't able to handle the pressure. All my friends were going to bed. My boy and I began to be sexually active. And she said, I didn't want to. She said it was a real downer. She said, I didn't enjoy it. She said, I felt dirty. She said, I felt cheap. But she said, the problem was everybody was doing it. Now the devil is doing that tonight. In Life Magazine in 1986, they said over 11 million teenagers are now sexually active. And many high schools that ain't got that much sense are causing to add problems to the problem by giving contraceptives and encouraging birth control so that young girls can their lust of the flesh. With no moral guidepost to guide them, teenagers are now left to make up their own minds about what is right and what is wrong. I heard of a young lady not long ago who messed, messed around with her boyfriend. She wound up getting pregnant. And the first thing you know, she, was, she didn't want her family to find out. She didn't want her teachers to find out. She didn't want the rest of it. So she went off to a city and had an abortion. She thought this will be the way that will be the answer to my problem. She said, nobody will ever know it, and I'll just have this thing done, and, and it'll just sweep it under the rug, and it'll not bother me anymore. That young lady later testified after the horror of that abortion when those little babies are aborted. I don't mean to, to bring up any bad memories for anybody. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I know the crowd this side. No doubt we, there's many here tonight that have had abortions. I, I'd say that probably for sure. I'm not trying to make you feel miserable. I'm trying to help some of these other young ladies uh, to keep them from making the same mistake. And this young girl, she said, she said, when we took them in there, that doctor, they used several methods to kill them babies. They said that sometimes they use the suction method where it's just like a vacuum cleaner and it tires their legs off their body and tires their arms off. And many times when the baby's laying over here on the table, still alive and kicking, they strangle them on the table and throw them in the trash can at hospitals all over North and South Carolina. And it's all, quote, in a day's work. That young girl said, I thought it was over. But she said, I went home. I could hear my baby's cries in my ear 
ears at night. She said, I could hear it when I'd lay down to sleep at night. I could hear my baby crying. And I wondered if it was a boy. I wondered if it was a girl. I could not bear the thought. They shoot salt in them baby. They burn their eyes and their mouth with salt to kill them and murder them and throw them in trash piles and dump them out. And I tell you, we got a generation that's having to live with that thing. And it's causing girls to commit suicide and causing them to want to take their own life with drugs or alcohol. Let me say to you girls and boys, it's not worth it going all the way before you reach, walk down that aisle and give yourself to that young man or that young lady that God has saved you from. It's a shot of the devil that you want to experiment with premarital sex. Yes, sir. They figure now in most high schools that one out of every two teenagers that walk across the stage to get their cap and gown are not virgins. And whereas when we went to school, many of us, it was nearly a shame if you had lost your virginity. The very opposite is true now. It's an embarrassing thing now if you're still a virgin. And they're telling now, as one girl says, I just wanted to get it over with. And they said that they they're saying now that now it is a virtue to be an unvirgin or lose your virginity, and it makes you look like something's wrong with you if you're still a virgin. And all this is is the devil knows that he can ruin your life if he can get you to go to the, the to the bed before you're married. I'm telling you, it's getting worse and worse and worse. They found several hundred young men who who are hanging from the shower rod where they have this one thing it's called um, um, uh, they got a name for it it's called erotic uh, hip, hip, hypnosis uh, asphyxiation and they're saying that uh, autoerotic asphyxiation is a thing where you partially hang yourself and you're flirting with death and they're saying that Hustler magazine, some of these magazines are carrying articles on these uh, procedures telling young people how to do it and they're hanging themselves down in their basement with ropes around their neck and involving themselves in abusing themselves sexually and they don't realize that there's a certain nerve in your neck that when that rope hits it just the right way that you go unconscious and then you're strangled to death before you realize it. So what starts out as a little fun and a little experimenting with the unknown turns out to be the devil shooting his dart of, of lust in your your heart and destroying you. Yes, sir, we're seeing AIDS spread among young people now by the thousands. We're seeing now that young boys and young girls, 10, 11, 12 years old, you don't have to be a homosexual to die with AIDS. You don't have to be a drug user to die with AIDS. It's passed through bodily fluid and bodily fluids such as saliva. It's been proven. It's passed through bodily fluids. It's in every bodily fluid that comes out of one person's body and can go into another, whether on by chance or on purpose. And young people tonight, the price is high to pay if you go out there and live your life in the lust of the flesh. The devil is using the God of sex to destroy young people by the million. That's why I tell our kids at our church, I said, stay pure, stay pure, stay pure, stay pure. I say all of you tonight, stay pure, stay pure. It'll be worth it one day. It might keep you alive. You don't think it's a killer? You say, Brother Danny, why is it so dangerous? Because it's breaking God's law. Fatal arrow number two. The devil's got a second arrow tonight aimed at your heart. He's trying to take your life, destroy your soul in hell. This arrow, of course, drugs. I'm going to give you the lowdown on getting high. By the age of 12 now, most young people in public schools and many in Christian schools are tempted with marijuana. And they're telling us nowadays that Miss Reagan, our, our president's wife, went into some school down near Atlanta. She took a survey. She asked third grade children who had, who had been offered marijuana and almost every one of them raised their hand in the third grade. Many preteens are using it. 
39% of all fourth graders said that they have their problems in their school among fourth graders with drugs. 31 million p young people in America has used marijuana and many of them right here in our town and your town stay stoned or high all day long at school just simply to get through another day. And let me say something right here to us mamas and daddies. It's about time some of you parents got your head out of the sand and realized school ain't like it was when you went. Brother, there's more hell been unleashed in our public school in the last 15 years than ever was when me and you went to school. I remember when I went to school, brother, we had dances, we had roll, we had all these things. I never saw any drugs, never saw any. The year after I graduated in the 70s, brother, there opened up a pit from hell. These things started coming from everywhere, and us as moms and daddies had better get concerned and ignored it like it's going to go away. They're, they blame their parents. You can talk to a young person, why are you on drugs? And they'll blame their parents for getting a divorce. They'll blame, they'll blame their parents family for fighting while they're at home. They'll blame everything in the world. And then sometimes they'll say, preacher, the blame is me. I know I shouldn't do it, but it's hard to turn it down when you're around a big crowd and they offer you a hit on a joint. And they're saying that the pressure is so great. Now it's hard for us to understand that these boys and girls here and these here in the schools where there is a tremendous pressure to experiment with drugs and not one kid in this room is above falling into that trap. Not mine, not yours. No, not a preacher's kid, a deacon's kid, not those that sing in a choir. The devil is trying to destroy them and is destroying them through drugs many, many, many times. I heard about a high school young man by the name of Brad. Brad got on drugs so bad, he just went from one drug to the other. He became a speed freak and messing with cocaine. And the next thing you know, he got into PCP, which is what they call in the high schools, angel dust. It's a drug that makes young people think that they have a supernatural power that to, to leap out of bills and, and jump over things and hit cars and things like that. Well, Brad got so bad that his mom and daddy was afraid of him. They said, we're afraid to see him coming home at night. We're afraid he's going to kill us or kill himself. Well, it wasn't long until some bad things happened that Brad's mom and daddy in high, had him in high school had him committed to an institution. They said, we can't do anything with him anymore. Still in high school, but yet in an institution. Not able to run up and down a gym floor and play ball. Not able to get out and go around the track. Not able to catch a football. Not able to drive a car. He was in an institution, girls. Boys, you hear me? He is in an institution where he could he was confined. You kids listen to me tonight. That's what drugs will do for you. That's what drugs will do for you. They'll kill you. I said they'll kill you. It's a devil trying to kill you through those drugs. You say, preacher, I can handle it. There's been a lot stronger ones than you said that. And they're in the grave tonight. Out yonder in a Christ grave. And somewhere in hell. They put old Brad in there. And his good, quote, friends smuggled some angel dust into the institution. And they said, hey, man, we got you some dope. And he got on that so bad that the nurse come in looking for him. They couldn't find him anywhere. They found him in his bathroom trying to flush his own head down the commode. They finally had to get him and put him in a padded cell where he couldn't do any damage to himself. This boy is in high school. And they put him in there and just where he just knocked his head up against the wall and where he could no longer do what he wanted to do. I could give you case after case after case after case of young people who experimented with drugs and they're no longer with us tonight. They're done gone on into a Christless grave. Listen to these statistics that I want to give you. You think about these famous stars. I'm going to be talking about maybe a little bit more in just a moment. And rock and roll singers and drugs. They killed Jimi Hendrix. It killed Janis Joplin. The devil killed Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. The devil killed Jim Morrison of the Doors when he OD'd on drugs. The devil killed Robbie McIntosh of the average white band with hair.
heroin. Devil killed Gary Thane of Uriah Heap with an overdose on drugs. The devil killed Vinnie Taylor of Shanana with an overdose of drugs. The devil killed Al Wilson of Canned Heat with an overdose on drugs. The devil killed Sid Vicious and his girlfriend with drugs. The devil killed Ron McKernan of the Grateful Dead with drugs. The devil killed Keith Moon of The Who with an overdose on drugs. The devil killed John Bonham of Led Zeppelin with vodka and his own vomit where he couldn't even roll over and throw up and choke to death on his own puke. The devil killed him and drug him into hell. The devil killed Bon Scott of ACDC with overdose of alcohol and drugs just a few weeks after he wrote the famous song Highway Hell and he made it there because the devil put that out of his head and he thought he could get by with it but it's a killer. It's a killer. I'm telling you tonight young people drugs will kill you. They'll kill you. They'll put you in the grave. Fatal factor number three. The third arrow that the devil is putting on young people tonight is the breakdown of the home. The devil's doing everything he can to break down every home he can. I call this point home, south home. And boy, many times young people today are coming home and it's nothing but a fuss and a fight from the time they walk into the door and many young people even leave home early because they don't want to hear mama and daddy fussing. And I said tonight to mamas and daddy, it's time we got on our knees and ask God to get that junk out of our heart and get where we can get along and pray because the devil's going to get our kids if we're not real careful. I tell you, if your family is not together tonight, you are headed for danger. It's hard enough for a young person who grows up in a state home where mom and daddy prays with them at night. But a young person doesn't have much chance whom mamas and daddies go their separate way. Sometimes there are exceptions and I thank God for it. But most of the time where there's trouble in the home and the trauma of divorce and family troubles, many times the young person will turn to these other things and get themselves in trouble. I'm thinking of a family right now. This family got saved. A man got saved. His wife got saved. They had two little boys. They they got going good to church. He became a deacon in a church. Matter of fact, and things went real good. They were going to church regular. These little boys started growing up. Somehow when the boys got up a little bit, the man and his wife began to have problems. I don't want all the problems involved, but I know they nearly separated and got a divorce. Needless to say, they dropped out of church. They quit taking those kids to Sunday school. They quit getting them in the youth choir. They quit getting them in there like they ought to be. Now those boys are grown up. They're done up in big years and one's already graduated from school. Those boys right now, when you run into those boys, you see one of them's their eyes is bloodshot. You can tell he's on drugs. You can tell that he's on the road to destruction. Already been in car wrecks on the way down, on the way down. And I believe tonight that somewhere back there, the devil put the air in the bow when that home started having family trouble and got that young man out of church. Oh, my Mamas and daddies, it, it really bothers me. And mamas and daddies will make sure that their younger never does miss a ball practice, never does miss a, a cheerleading practice, never does. Miss, but they don't care if they go to church or not. They just let them make up their own mind. And the devil's breaking up their homes, our boys and girls, by the thousands. Home, sour home. One day. Boys and girls, I'm talking to some young men here this today that's being disrespectful to your parents. I'm talking to some teenage girls here. No doubt you may have had a fuss with your mama this morning. You may have even seen when you want to do something and they won't let you. And then the devil says, you don't need them, the old man and old woman. And you start saying, I hate my mama. And I've known teenage girls to go in their room and put their face down in the cover and I've seen, I've heard up seen them beating the, the mattress with their fist and saying I hate my mother I wish she's dead yeah and one of these days good girl let me tell you what's going to happen to you mama is going to be dead and you're going to walk around in some funeral home and see your mama's cold still face 
are laying in a casket. That's what's going to happen to you. That's a devil causing you to hate your mom and daddy. I challenge every young person here tonight to get that junk that you've got against your parents out of your heart. Go home tonight and grab your mom and daddy around the neck and tell them you love them. I imagine there's some young people here tonight. Oh, you say, oh, I, you need your bottom busted. You little brat. You, you do. You brat. You. I can see some of you girls. Look on your face. You, you look like Tammy Faye from here. You say, I ain't coming back. I'm going to get you while you're here. It's a good change for me. Lord, you got them eyebrows glued on. And you say, I ain't going to hug my mama. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. He said, well, I'd be on a date right now if my mama made me come here to this dumb youth. Your mama might be keeping you out of hell. Your mama might be keeping you out of hell. I tell you, you ain't got enough sense to realize it now, but the day will come when you'll say, thank God my mama made me go to church. Thank God my mama made me go to youth rally. Thank God they didn't want me down in Charlotte. Listen, there's kids in shutting ice from places in rock concerts. You know why they're there? Many of them, mom and daddy don't care about them. What about that boy come in? His daddy had a big souped up hot rod, you know, and everything. He said, daddy, the Bible says, if you don't let me have the car, that you hate me. His daddy said, no, no, it don't, son. He said, yes, it does. He said, where does it say that? He that spareth his rod hateth his son. <laughs> i give you a good one there. You need to remember that, boys. You can use that. <laughs> one day, every one of us going to be mighty, mighty sorry for being disrespectful to our mamas and daddies. Fatal factor number four. Devil tonight. Every one of you boys and girls, you listening to me? You boys listening? Every one of you, the devil has an arrow pointed right towards your heart wanting to kill you. Fatal factor number four. Rock idols. Rock and roll idols. You say, no, I don't want you. I'll just shut up a minute. Listen to me. What an impact rock and roll idols are having on young people. I ain't even going to discuss music tonight. There's a lot of aspects of it we could get into. I'm going to tell you what them singers is trying to get you to do. The devil's using them as an arrow to kill you. And, you, and you, you need to realize that. You see, kids have idols. You think, you think rock musicians ain't idols? You think I'm using that word idol loosely, huh? You think I'm exaggerating a little bit? Did you know that Michael Jackson just, they said just recently in, a, in, a, in a, one of the magazines, he made $70 million of one record, one, one song, Thriller. One song, man, 70 million bucks. And the other day bought the right to the Beatles records now, paid cash for them, $37 million. Now, let me say something to mamas and daddies before I move on. Hey, man, mamas and dads, when a little old backslid Jehovah Witness squirt makes 10,000 times more money in the United States. We're in a mess in this nation. We are in a mess. Some of those vulgar, filthy, obscene, vile, nasty things. Listen, when judgment day comes, God Almighty is going to charge that crowd with the murder of millions of people and sending them to hell. You wait and see. Wait and see. You see, kids have idols. They have heroes that they want to be like. When I was little, I'd sit and watch ball games for hours. I'd sit there and I'd watch. And we'd go outside. I'd go out at halftime, man. Get the ball. I'm so-and-so. You know, I'd be like... I'd do it like this, and I'd put it between my legs, and I could buy, and I'd do all this stuff, and I'd do my best to act like 
I'd even try to walk like them ball players, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think bad. You know how they learn how to walk down there in different places? Watching the chickens out in the yard. who's got a sour look on their face. I want to tell you something tonight, folks. Kids got idols. They're going to have some idols. They're going to try to do like their idols say. I, talked, I took these boys to church women one night, a bunch of old hippie kind of guys, you know. I took them with me to revival, and I thought I'd try to witness them, you know. That's what, they couldn't stand up straight or nothing. And one of them had on an old pair of blue jeans. You know what the dummies do nowadays? They don't get down the floor and play like we used to, wire holes in them, they cut holes in them. Amen. Little sissy can't get down playing on his knees no more. So he has to cut him a hole in his blue jeans. Brother, when I was growing up, we didn't have to cut no holes in there. My mom ironed them, old, remember them old patches you ironed on them thing? You'd wire them, she'd iron them on it. My, I'd have a new pair of blue jeans, they'd be, have holes in the knee in just a little while. But now they had, and this one guy had a big rag tied around his leg. He did. And I, we went to the store and I was going to buy him something to drink. And I said, why you got that rag tied around your leg? And you know what he done? He's 15 years old. His hair way down here. Had on old, you know, tried a rough looking clothes, bunch of signs on it, you know, and everything. And he's uh, had a rag tied around. He, I said, why you got that rag? I know why he had it tied around there. Because his idols have one tied around there. You say, boxers. You know, them bo I've seen the little, come on, you know, I'm so-and-so. I'm Muhammad Ali. I'm the Rock and Roll Express. You know, I'm this, I'm that. They have idols. Idols. All right, now listen to what their idols are saying. Old Prince. Got a song called Sister. Talks about incest. You know what they're doing? Fatal factor number four. Give them that one more time. Bro. The devil's using rock idols and splitting some young people's heads and dropping them in hell. Let me give them to you, okay? Twisted sister has an MTV video called We're Not Gonna Take It. And in this video, it's telling young people, you don't have to do what your parents says. And it has a young man shoving his daddy down the steps. And you know what? Lover Boy, the song Teen Overdose, talks about a teenager going to commit suicide. Listen to me. I'm telling you how the devil's killing them. Ozzy Osbourne, of course, you know his song, Suicide Solution. You say, Brother Danny, nobody don't listen to the words of them song. There's a young man out in California begin to listen to Ozzy Osbourne's song, Suicide Solution, constantly. The song says this. Wine is fine. Liquor is quicker. Go home. Make up your bed. Rest your head. Put the gun to your head. Suicide is the only way out. Why don't you kill yourself? They found this young man in his bed, made it up, the gun to his head. We had a bullet through his head. His headphones were on. Ozzy Oz's record, Suicide Solution, was spinning on the turntable. His mom and daddy just recently sued Ozzy Osbourne for the murder of their son. Now, we know who murdered that boy. The devil did. He's a murderer from the beginning. And he used Ozzy Osbourne as an arrow to talk that boy into killing himself. And I'm talking about a teenage boy. I'm talking about just like this young man, just like this young lady. Them's real kids out there dying. They got real feelings. They got, they're just like these kids here tonight. They're just a bunch of freaks that ain't got no soul, no feeling. They're boys and girls. They're some mama's baby. 
There's some little boy, some little girl that was an apple of mama and grandmother's eye. And they're being talked into killing themselves. You know what all you're said? He said, that song produces a hypnotic effect. They're suing him because that young man was talked into killing himself. ACDC song, Shoot the Thrill, tells young people, pull the trigger for the ultimate thrill. Elton John, suicide. Listen to the words, folks. I'm getting bored being a part of mankind. Not a lot to do anymore. This race is a waste of time. People rushing everywhere, swarming like flies. Think I'll buy myself a 44 and give them all a surprise. Yay, I think I'm going to kill myself. Try a little suicide. This is being pumped into kids' minds and hearts seven days a week, six hours a day. The average young person. Is that any real? Uh, uh, is it, do you wonder why over 500,000 teenagers a year attempt suicide and 14 do every day and kill themselves? Fourteen on that front row. Y'all stand up. That many teenagers kill themselves every day. Every day. It's coming home to us sooner or later. Y'all can be seated. Listen, 6,800 a year. That means the average high school with 1,800 students, something like that. That means this, young people. Over four whole high schools commit suicide every year in America. Four whole schools. Nearly one per minute. Kill yourself to live by Black Sabbath. Talks about hopelessness and despair. Killing children by the dead Kennedys. Let me quote you the words. I kill children. I love to see them die. I kill children to make their mothers cry. Blue Oster Cult has a song called I'm Burning For You. And it has a young man in a car who's in love with this girl. And he said, I'm burning myself up for you. And he sets himself on fire. And commits suicide for his girlfriend. The pet shop boys have a video that shows a boy putting a gun right to his head. But Elton John's song, Someone Saved My Life Tonight, is about a teenager who went out to commit suicide, and he committed suicide at 4 a.m. in the morning. They found young Alan in a garage. He was in his car, died of poor, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. This coroner said he died at 4.10 a.m. In the tape player was Elton John's song playing, Someone Saved My Life Tonight. The devil's trying to kill you, kids. He's trying to kill you. Fatal factor number five. What's the worst problem in America tonight among young people? It's alcohol. Drinking. In Buffalo, New York, a senior old boy murdered his father with a rifle. He told police he had drunk 17 to 20 beers before he did it. In Rayfield, California, a man choked his wife to death because he was drunk. That's what made them old-time preachers say, I'd rather own stock in hell than in a brewery. Any of you mamas and daddies here tonight ain't got no more sense than to put your approval on alcohol, any form, fashion. You, you need to go have your head looked at. Hey, it's a hypocrite that'll tell young boys and girls, I better not never catch you drinking when you keep your wine in the refrigerator. Amen. You say, I don't like that. Well, I don't like keeping wine in the refrigerator neither. You say, I'll beat you up. You meet me right out there after service. If I ain't there in five minutes, start without me. <laughs> and all my bodyguards, too. I'm going to tell you something tonight, friend. It's about time, mamas and daddies. By the way, let me back up here and say something. 
I think it's a big hypocrite, too, to fuss at boys and girls for listening to bad rock and roll music when mom and daddies listen to them jumping in bed on their country and western. Amen? Somebody ought to put out a country western presentation. Oh, you say, Brother Danny, oh, no, don't you start on the mandrails and, and Porter and Dolly. And, oh, yes, we know, we know. They're all good Christians. So his striper and Madonna started out to be a nun, you know. We know, and everybody's saved nowadays. Oh, Dolly will make a movie next year called The Best Little Horror House in Texas, and then year after that, The Best Little Sunday School in Tennessee. Hey, man. Hey, man. This stuff's killing our kids. It's drinking stuff. Young people. Many young people tonight, right now, while we're in here enjoying ourselves in this service, are crawling into automobiles. They're going to the, the liquor store. They're going to the bootleggers. They got somebody older with them that can go in and buy it. They're going off to have a wild party and will never walk away from it alive before tomorrow morning. Last year, nearly 9,000 teenagers got a bottle in a car to go have a blast and never live to tell about it. 17-year-old who committed murder said, Drink caused all my problems. Every time you take a drink, teenagers, remember what it did to me. He was going to prison. They was going to lock him up. They was putting him behind bars. And he said, Teenagers, every time you start to take a drink, Remember what it done to me. In Florida, a boy and girl were killed not long ago in a fatal accident because of liquor. The preacher was down there and the fellow who worked with the paramedics took some pictures of the accident. He skipped school one day, got him a bottle of booze and decided they'd ride around. Wasn't too many, too long till they was drunk. The car ran off the interstate bridge, plunged into a river. And the coroner came up to the preacher and he said, Preacher, don't look at these pictures. And the preacher looked at those pictures and his heart broke. He said, There was that young man, that young lady in that car. He said, The young man was sitting, who has, was, was driving, was sitting in the back seat. He said, His head was twisted all the way around like it was backwards. He said his body was cocked in a weird, unusual position. He said that young teenage girl was in the front where the driver's seat is. Her head was down near the accelerator pedal and the gas pedal. Her body was up the front seat. Her body was masked and wrapped around the steering wheel. One of her legs stuck through the windshield. She said her dress had come up over her belly. It was wet because of the river that they had drunk, pulled them out of. And he said that young girl's hand was sticking out like that toward the door. And it almost was like while that car was going down in that river, even though they were drunk and even though they didn't know what was going on, they knew something was wrong and she was trying to reach for her way out. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen tonight, there's thousands of them out there tonight just like reaching for something to help them. They know they're going down and they're reaching and the devil's taking them to hell by the millions. Up north there's a boy got saved and I'll say this and I'm closing. His name was Jerry and his good friend Sandy got saved and Sandy had been a dope addict, been on drugs a lot. This young girl got saved and got on fire for God. She started carrying her Bible to school like this young lady from Pisgah. And she would sit, she'd take a shower every morning and wash her hair and it'd be real clean. And the boys would get behind her on the bus and say, Hey, Sandy, you still love Jesus? You're a Jesus freak, ain't you? And spit. In her, after she had washed it. And Sandy stood firm for the Lord and started telling about Jesus. And he, the, she had a friend named Lisa. 
Lisa's 14 years old. And Lisa was a popular girl in school, although she wasn't on drugs. She was really basically a good person as far as morals are concerned. And they had her on their hit list, they called it. They called target teens, and certain ones on their list is really after trying to get them saved. And so she went and talked to Lisa one day, and Sandy said, Lisa, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And Lisa said, well, no. I go to church every week, but I don't want to go to heaven if I died. Sandy said, well, Lisa, you need to get saved. You need to get right with the Lord. Why don't you, why don't you get it right? And she said, oh, I've got plenty of time for that. I'm only 14. She said, Lisa, I'm not exaggerating the story, folks. This is just the way it happened. She said, Lisa, what if you went out tomorrow and died? Lisa said, I'm only 14. I'm happy. I'm healthy. That's not going to happen to me. The next day, Lisa came home from school. She said, Mama, I got a headache. She had done the dishes after supper, and she said, I'm going to go lay down. She went and laid down for a while. Some friends came knocking on the door. Lisa home. She come, she come to the door. They said, come on, mess around. Let's go ride around town, have some fun. She said, I just don't feel like it, y'all. She said, I got a terrible headache. They said, oh, come on. She finally said, no, I'm not going. So they left. That night, or that afternoon, I should say, Lisa's head started hurting worse. She said, Mama, I'll be there in just a minute. She was coming out of the room. Mom said, she hit the floor. Her mom went running in there screaming. They found Lisa's body unconscious on that floor, 14 years old. This happened not too far from here up north. She went and called the, the ambulance. She called somebody from next door. The nurse came over. They threw her body on a stretcher. They rushed it downtown and slammed through the doors at the hospital. She was pronounced dead by the time they got there. They ordered an autopsy, and tried, the, the doctors got, went to work on her to find out what was the cause of death. And you know something weird, young people? They could not find one medical or clinical reason for that girl dying. She just died, just like that. Young lady not long ago, they was out partying, living it up, having a big time. They were flying down the road car. This happened out west where I'd been preaching revival not just a few weeks ago. The car ran off the road. It happened about Wednesday during the revival where I was preaching. She was hanging her head out like this and hollering at some young people behind them or something. They were cut. That car went off that road like that. Down a hill, and, she was, and a tree caught her and took her head and neck right off of her body. Her body in the car was way down yonder. Her head and neck was way back there. And the paramedic who came and took care of that accident and saw that thing there said he literally threw up for 30 minutes at that scene. You know why? Because the devil, he's flying all around this place right now. He's around this world. He's over your hometown. And he's got these arrows pointed at you. And he's trying to kill you. And I tell you what I want you to do. You see these? Every young person in here tonight that'll do this. Lust of the flesh, you're going to say, I'm going to wait till I'm married. Do like God wants me to do. Every young person will say, no drugs for me. No shape, no form. I ain't going to try them to see if I like them. No! Every young person in here that will say, I'm going to go home tonight, tell my mom and daddy that I love them. I want my home to be what it ought to be. Listen, listen. If you get mom and daddy and love them like you ought to and everything, it might even help them a little bit. Maybe some of you young people will say, I ain't going to let that bunch of fools tell me how to kill myself. It's a song of fools, the Bible said. And you might hear tonight say, no alcohol for me. Hey, 
I wonder how many 11 and 12 year olds here they are tonight that'd say, no way, I don't care how much they offer it to me, I'm going to make a vow to God tonight. I'll never drink liquor, I'll never drink beer, I'll never drink wine. You say, well, Brother Danny, it's wrong to make a vow and not pay it. I ain't asking you to make a vow and not pay it. I'm asking you to make a vow and pay it. I'm asking you to tell God Almighty tonight, no dope for me, no liquor for me, no wine for me, no booze for me. I'm loving my mom and dad. And I'm staying straight. Wonder how many tonight, while they get a, the song ready, Brother Roy Lee, there's not enough room here tonight to have a, everyone in the altar, I don't guess. We'll ask you tonight here from up here just to stand if you want to make a commitment. If you need to come down here in the altar, there's about room for maybe 50 or 60 here in the altar. If not, you can stand right in the aisles. Brother Roy Lee, I wonder how many tonight say, Preacher, I don't want, I don't want the devil to kill me. You know what that is? That Scottish bagpipes playing Amazing Grace. I want you girls tonight to say when I walk down the aisle, I'm going to be a virgin. Preacher, tonight things are going to be changed in my life. Tonight, preacher, from this moment on, if maybe you've been drinking. Maybe you've been sipping on a beer, sipping on a liquor bottle. And tonight you want to just come down here and stand. I want you to do that right now. We're going to pray with you before you leave. Just get out of your seat and come on down here tonight. There you go. Somebody pray with this young man right here. Come on up here, boys, and pray with me. Take that stand tonight. You'll say, by the grace of God, no dope for me, no liquor for me, no drugs for me.